Today, I want to talk to you about uh, a subject that some people get a little leery about. Some people, <coughs> whenever a pastor starts to talk about this, they get a little afraid. But I don't want you to be. I think it's going to be something that will be very helpful today. We're going to talk about generosity starts in the heart. Not with the size of your bank account, but with your heart. You know that the Bible has a lot to say about money. Uh, it has a lot to say about possessions and managing your money and the blessings that come from being generous. In fact, one of the most famous quotes that Jesus ever uh, had recorded was that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Um, found in the book of Acts. But Jesus was known for saying this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And so uh, the Bible teaches us that um, our hearts are very, very important when it comes to the subject of money and possessions. It teaches us how to act toward them, how to think about them. In fact, the Bible teaches us that an inordinate love for money brings ruin. I mean, it can ruin your relationships. It can ruin you spiritually. Um, it can ruin you emotionally. I've seen people uh, become completely ruined because they have the wrong attitude about money and possessions. So the Bible tells us that God owns everything, that He is the one that supplies, and that our job is simply to be a steward. We're to be a good steward. We're to steward what is God's. We are to take care of what He owns. Uh, I believe the scripture is clear that being generous brings blessings. In the book of, book of Proverbs, it talks about that there are those that withhold, they're stingy, they're wealthy, but they're poor. And then there are those that they give and they're blessed. And, and we see this happen time and time again, practically speaking. And so the Bible tells us that uh, we are most like God when we're generous, that our job is to be a steward, uh, that God blesses us when we are generous. He blesses us when we have the right attitude toward money and possessions and our job and our time. We are to understand that generosity does not begin with the bank account, but rather with the heart. And so today I want to read to you a passage of scripture that I think will show us what it means to be generous, shows us how to be generous. In fact, it's one of the most famous passages of scripture, and it shows us a very important lesson. I want you to get this. You can be poor and generous, or you can be poor and stingy. You can be rich and generous, or you can be rich and selfish and stingy. So it has nothing to do with the amount of money that you actually have. How many of you have heard this uh, expression before? Uh, that guy, he would give you the shirt off of his back. Well, that expresses a generous heart, uh, one that doesn't matter how much money they have. And I, I can recall this uh, with my great-grandmother Miller. They were not wealthy. They were tobacco farmers. Um, never had a whole lot of money, but my great-grandma Miller, Clara Miller was her name, uh, she was one of the most generous people you've ever met. You, did you have a grandma like this? You could not go to her house unless you ate something. Uh, she would be offended, and uh, so I loved going to her house, all right? Even if I had just eaten, I knew that I was going to get me some real good biscuits. And uh, she was a very generous woman, uh, but even though she wasn't very wealthy, okay, she didn't have a whole lot of money. But today, we're going to learn that Jesus himself shows us that it's not the size of the bank account that matters, but it's the attitude of the heart that matters most. So read with me in Mark chapter 12. Uh, and beginning in verse number 41. Uh, and he sat down, this is Jesus. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting the money 
into the offering box. So he's just sitting here watching. He's watching those that give. And many rich people put in large sums, it says. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And by the way, uh, just so we clarify, in Jesus' day, the truth is um, that widows were probably more common than they are today. Not that uh, we don't have widows today, but typically... Uh, women live longer than men, and particularly in that culture. Uh, men were a little older, typically, than uh, the women that they married, and it was not uncommon for a woman to be 14, 15, 16 years old to get married, and a young man to be 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, sometimes they're older than that. But it was very common for a widow to be around, but also for a widow to be very poor. You see, there was no... Uh, social safety net in that day. There was no government program. There was no social security. Uh, there were no retirement, uh, individual retirement accounts. There was no stock market. You either were taken care of by what money they had earned and saved, or you went back to live with your family. And so often, a widow would be very, very poor. Okay, so I want you to get this picture. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing. Notice the word, the intentional word. They are contributing out of what they have, out of their abundance. There's a difference between a sacrificial gift real generosity, and just simply a contribution. It's like the, the pig and the chicken, uh, they were walking down the road and they saw a sign that said, uh, raising money for children with a ham and egg uh, breakfast. And that chicken looked at the pig and said, well, let's go make a donation. And the pig looked at the chicken and said, that's a donation for you. For me, it's total commitment. And so we often... Uh, in our generosity or our idea of generosity, we do what the wealthy were doing here. We just kind of give without thinking. We give without costing us really anything. But this, wo this widow, she gave out of her poverty, it says. He says, this widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Well, how did this poor widow become an example to us? Thousands of years later, she's still an example. Thousands of years later, nearly 2,000 years ago, uh, this woman um, who was a poor widow became a shining example that Jesus himself held up for us to emulate in our life. So what did she do that we ought to do? That's the question. How do we become generous, and how do we let it uh, really be a positive thing in our life? Well, number one, she had a heart for God. Generosity begins in the heart. She had a heart for God. She gave... Because she loved God. That was it. She didn't give because there was some big campaign. She didn't give because there was pressure to give. No one was pressuring her. She gave because she loved God. And for you and me, the same thing is true. If we want to be truly generous, we've got to give because of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We give because of our relationship with God. Now, it's interesting, it says in this text that they were putting into the offering box. So you'll understand a little bit about the way that Jewish culture worked then. The offering box was a free will offering. Now, there were other places where they collected the temple tax. Now, temple tax was not really a gift. It was a tax, and every Jewish person had to pay it. And that kind of went toward the upkeep of the temple and all this kind of stuff. And so they had to give this. But the offering box was a free will offering. 
No one was forced. No one was coerced. No one was taxed. She gave in the offering box. Now, I think you and I need to learn from that, that what this shows us is that our heart for God should be tied to the mission of Jesus himself, the mission of God, the work of God. That's literally what this woman was doing. She was doing something that she was not forced to do. She was doing it because she loved the Lord. She was doing it because she was willing to give in a free will offering, and this free will offering went specifically to the work of the ministry and the work of God. You know, it's sometimes tempting for people to say, well, the church is just after your money. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. The fact is, what we're after is your heart. When you give your heart to the Lord, then you'll have a heart for ministry. And what does the heart of ministry do? Well, it doesn't just become generous, but it becomes about the mission, God's work here on the earth. And so when my heart becomes generous, by the way, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when I learn to give, what is it saying about me? It says that I love God. It says that I'm concerned about the mission of God. It says that I'm concerned about reaching people with the gospel because you cannot do ministry without money. You know, I, somebody asked me one time, how much ministry can you do for $100? About $100 worth. That's about it, okay? So when I give, understand this all ties together to my spiritual relationship, my love for God. What does it do? It says, I'm interested in fulfilling the Great Commission. I'm interested in seeing people saved. I'm interested in getting the good news to people all around the world. I'm interested in what Jesus came to do. I am interested in the church. I am interested in helping families. I am interested in helping people grow in their faith. I am interested in doing what God has called us as a church to do. You see, it begins with the heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, one thing that you need to understand about this, and I think this is very instructive, is that, once again, it has nothing to do with your status. It has nothing to do with the size of her bank account. In fact, it's interesting to me that when the New Testament was written, the people that Jesus, Jesus often chose to be the greatest examples were women. And you say, why is that significant? Well, because in that culture, women were not, they weren't allowed to vote, they weren't allowed to own land, they weren't allowed to do a lot of things that men were allowed to do because they were considered Oh, not that they weren't important, but that they were considered uh, of lesser authority, if you will. In fact, even in a court of law, a woman could have seen a person uh, commit first-degree murder. If they were the only witness, that witness, even though she was an eyewitness to it, would not be allowed in the court. Okay, So the interesting thing is that Jesus chose a widow, a woman to be an example. And not just this, she wasn't the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. She wasn't a, a wealthy woman. She was a poor widow. In fact, we can read from this that she may not even have known where her next meal was coming from, which reinforces my belief when people say, well, I can't afford to give. I always say you can't afford not to give. And I really believe that because this woman, just like the Old Testament prophet, a woman and her son about to eat their last meal, they thought, and the prophet said, you put God first, you prepare this meal for me so that I can do the mission of God, the work of God, and she did, and God never let the oil run dry or the flour run out. Even in the middle of a famine, God supplied this woman's need, and the point is that Giving, generosity, begins in the heart. Galatians 2.28, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one 
in Christ Jesus. Once again, it has nothing to do with the size of your bank account, but it has to do with the attitude of your heart. Number two, she had a heart, not only that loved God, but she had a heart that trusted God. She trusted Him. Um, and I'll, this is something that we need to learn. God values the giver more than the gift. God values you more than what you're able to give. He values the giver more than the gift. And when we understand this, then um, it changes everything, okay? Now, once again, this is not about uh, looking at your financial bottom line and making the decision that I can give this much or that much or whatever. This is about trusting God. This is about putting God first. This is about believing that God is the one who supplies your needs. She, uh, she understood that God values our attitude more than the amount that we're able to give. I, I love that uh, the, even when she thought she could not afford it, she was generous. Jesus noted that true generosity is demonstrated when it costs you something. That's how you know whether you're generous or not, when it actually costs you something. I mean, the fact is, anybody can give out a surplus. Anybody can give out of the leftover. Anybody can give when all of your needs and wants have been met. I always marvel at people that uh, make a big deal out of extremely wealthy people, and some of whom are very generous, I, I do admit that. But there are some, if you take a billionaire and he gives a $10,000 gift to someone, that's like you or me giving like a, less than a buck. That's no big generosity, even though it's a big amount. And we look at the amount, but God looks at the heart. And so what we must understand is that God uh, wants us to trust in him. It doesn't have anything to do with the size of our bank account. Then the last point is this. She gave and had a heart for the mission of God. Listen to this. I'm reading this from the Living Bible because I like the way this reads. Luke 12, 31. He will always give you all you need from day to day if you will make the kingdom of God your primary concern. He'll always give what you need day by day. You ever... Just think, boy, if I could just make sure that my future is secure, and I'm going to make sure that I've got enough money for the next 20 years. I'm going to live in retirement. Nothing wrong with retiring. Should plan for that. But that's not what Jesus really told us to do. Now, in, throughout the Bible, it does tell us to prepare for the future, save, don't spend more than you make. Yes, all these principles. But in our prayers, here's what God tells us. This is what Jesus himself tells us, give us today our daily bread. God take care of today. That is a day by day living in the presence of God, living under the power of God, living by trusting God day by day in your life. And it's really easy to get nervous about the future. Once again, the Bible is clear. We are to prepare for the future. We are to save. We're not to overspend. We're to pay off our debts. We are to manage our money well, no doubt, okay? We're to save for retirement, no doubt. But here's the point. Why do I worry about tomorrow when tomorrow's not here yet? I've got to pray, Lord, take care of my needs today. Today. And when I do that, I believe God um, always gives us what we need. Not only that, let's look at that verse again. He will always give you all you need from day to day. That's the regular living part. If you will make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Are you concerned about the kingdom of God? Are you in love with God to the point that you want to support his mission, his message, his word throughout the world? When I do that, things begin to change in my life. 
I, I want to close today with a, a story. And I've told this story in, in a partial way before, but I'm going to tell it fully today. Um, this is about what God has taught me in my life about generosity. My parents taught me to tithe when I was 10 years old. I used to get 10 cents a week allowance. Uh, that takes a long time. When you give the first penny of that to God, it takes a long time to save a dollar. When I was like 10 years old, I saved up two $1 bills, and I got me a wallet to put it in and walked around uh, whatever grade I was in at 10 years old. Thought I was big stuff, man. In fact, I had a girlfriend, 10 years old. I had a girlfriend, and one day at recess, we actually had recess back in those days in school, uh, I took out one of my $1 bills to impress her, okay? And uh, she wanted an ice, a popsicle, and so I bought her a popsicle and uh, broke my heart because I no longer had two $1 bills anymore in my, in my wallet. But here's the point. I learned when I was 10 years old to start tithing. And then when I was a little bit older, my parents taught me not only to tithe, but also to save. And so as a young man, I began to learn how to do this. I learned to tithe. That was first. And I began to save. And then God began to bless me. If you think that God only blesses old people, you've not really read the Bible, okay? Um, God began to bless me even as a teenage boy. I began to put God first in my life. I began to try my best to serve God. And I even put God first in my finances. Uh, by the time I was 17 years old, I made $400 a week after taxes. Now, I did the conversion um, that's around $1,300 a week today. Now, imagine a 17-year-old kid making $1,300 a week with no bills. Uh, I had a lot of disposable cash, but I saved most of it, okay? And so uh, God taught me to tithe, and I'd learned that lesson. God taught me to save. And I'd actually saved, when I was, by the time I was 17, I'd saved enough money. I paid cash for my first car, just paid cash for it, bought it, and uh, ended up getting a 1973 Pinto station wagon with wood grain paneling down the sides. Okay, I didn't say it was a fancy car. I just said I paid cash for my first car. A babe magnet, it was not. All right, I'm just saying. All right. But um, so I'd pay cash for my first car. And then I'd saved enough money for my entire first year of college. And here I was, a 17-year-old kid. God had called me in the ministry. I knew that for sure. God had called me to go off and began to prepare for the ministry. I knew that I was supposed to go to Bible college and then later seminary and that I was going to have to pay for it. There was no uh, scholarship program that I knew of. There was no government loans that I was going to be able to get. It was going to be pay as you go. And I was 17. And man, I had my plan. I knew what God wanted me to do. And there was a missionary that came by our, our church, and he began to tell this story about building churches where he was in this foreign country, and he told about a man that was building a church building, and he was so in love with the Lord, he so much wanted to please God, and he so much wanted to, be, uh, to see people saved, he built for this missionary a church building, and he, you know, he had plaster on the walls, and he had no tools. This man, he told me this story about this man that put the plaster on the walls of this church with his bare hands. And God so moved my heart that I knew that God wanted me to do something that was risky, extraordinary, some would say crazy, some would say unreasonable. But God spoke to my heart about giving everything that I had saved for my first year of college to that missionary so that he could build a church, a church, a church. You ever start to argue with God when God tells you to do something? Oh, my parents are going to be upset. Oh, I can't afford this. 
Oh, there's no way I won't be able to afford to go to college. And God, you've called me into the ministry, and I know that's what you want. I'm not going to, I don't know that I want to do this. And so I did what most of us do when God speaks to us about something extraordinary in our lives. I gave 100 bucks. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did. I went up, they had an altar thing, and I went up and I, I gave this missionary 100 bucks. And I, and I went back to my seat. I was only 17. You ever not do what God tells you to do and he just kind of like tapping you, not literally and not audibly, but like, you know, hey, that's not what I told you to do. That's not what I said for you to do. So I sat back down in my seat and I was waiting and God was not leaving me alone. And I said, okay. And I went back up front again. And I told this missionary, and I gave him thousands of dollars to build a church. To build a church. I had no idea the, the beautiful picture of what my life was going to look like around church, around building a church, around building people. I knew God had called me, and there was a visible real life example of faith that God wanted to use in my life. Well, about a week later, I got a phone call from a man that I'd never met. I'd never even heard his name before. In fact, when he called me, I thought it was a prank call. But this man, out of the blue, not even from the same state that I lived in, he called me and says, is your name Richie Miller? I said, yes, it is. He said, my name is Tom Always. And I'm like, okay. And this man, to make a long story short, paid for all four years of my college. Now, you give God a hand on it, because I, I want you to get this, okay? I wanted to pay for one year of college. God wanted to pay for four. I wanted to build a church. I was only 17. I wanted to build a church. God wanted me to build hundreds. I wanted to have an impact on a small group of people, but God wanted to use my life in a way that I never dreamed possible. Now I'm 59 years old, and I've been in ministry literally since I was 17 years old. When I was a freshman in college, you see, I didn't tell you the rest of the story, I gave that money and God paid for me to go to college. But you know what happened? I made this ministry team starting at 17 years old. I traveled for four years of college to over 400 churches and ministered in them all across this nation. And I was able to reach adults and I was able to preach to teenagers and I was able to do things that I never even knew that were possible for me to do. Why do I tell you that story? Because generosity begins in the heart. It begins with a heart for God. It begins with obedience to what God has called you to do. Now, am I suggesting that God wants you to go home and empty out your bank account? No, I'm not saying that at all. Though if you want to, see me after the service. All right, that's just all I'm saying. But no, I'm not saying that. That's probably not God's will for most of you. But I do know this. God speaks to us often about things that we just like, blah, 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 I don't want to hear that. Right? Am I the only one? Okay. Oh, I'm the only one that does that? All right. Uh, don't, don't act like you're so spiritual and pious. The truth of the matter is, we often fall short of what God has in mind for us because we don't have our attitude right. We're like, well, there's no way. That's why it's called faith. That's why. Is faith scary? Yeah, it is. You know what I grappled with even as a 17-year-old kid when I gave that money? You know what I grappled with? That I wasn't going to be able to go to Bible college, that I wasn't going to be able to afford it, that I would get left behind and you know what began to really, really mess with my mind? I began to think that God would never use me. 
I began to think, there's no way that I'll ever, ever, ever able to be, be able to do any of that that matters. And the devil began to play on my mind that there was no way that God was going to use my life. But let me tell you, anything and anyone that is given to God, and you give your life to Him, and you follow Him with all your heart, God will use you more than you ever thought possible. I wanted to minister to one church while I was in college. God wanted me to minister to over 400. I wanted to pay for one year of college. God wanted to pay for it all. I wanted to help build one church. God has allowed me to be the senior pastor of two churches in my ministry which combined have built over 100 churches across this world for the kingdom of God. You say, what are you saying? Oh, I'm just saying that obey God. Say yes. I get that it's scary, and I get that you don't know sometimes, just like that widow, where your next meal is going to come from. But here's what I know. I know what the Bible says. And I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I believe it's God's word to us. I believe that it's true. I believe that it never fails. But not only do I have that, but I have the living example of my past. Whenever you start to doubt God, sometimes it's good to look in the past. Oh, I remember when he took care of me then. I remember when he answered that prayer then. Oh, I remember where I didn't think we were going to be able to pay that bill and God provided for it. Oh, I remember. And God blesses. So, you want to be generous? It starts with the heart, with the attitude. Do you have the attitude of saying yes to God? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us today to say yes to you. Help us to follow you with all of our heart. Help us to do your will. Help us to obey you even when it's scary. Oh, man, sometimes we get scared. Sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes we allow the devil to play with our mind and make us think that we're going to fail. But there is no failure in obedience to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to give ourselves completely to you and to say yes to you in everything you tell us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me encourage you. We're going to have our offering now in just a moment. Uh, but let me tell you a couple things just to remind you. Don't forget about if you want to give to the Children's Village, you designate it to hope. That's how we know what's been given. Designate it to hope. And also put in your next step cards and so forth um, in the offering as it passes okay uh let's have our ushers to come and uh, they're going to pass the buckets at this time and uh how can you give here at stillwater's church well you can give them the buckets when they're passed that's obvious um go ahead and start that guys if you will you can also give online at stillwaters.online and you can actually set that up as recurring giving uh so that you uh Automate your giving just like you automate your bills. How many have some form of automated bills in some way? Raise your hand. You, you guys, I, I do everything that I can. I try to automate. All right, except, and I'm going to say this. I just told you to, you can automate it. I don't automate my giving. And I'll tell you why. Because I like the act of worship. Not that you don't worship when you automate it. But I'm just simply saying, for me, I like, even though I'm giving it on the Church Center app, I like that moment of worship that I give to God. So you can give by uh, going to stillwaters.online. You can give by texting the number 84321, 84321, or you can give at the Church Center app, which is the easiest and most convenient way to give. It keeps up with all of your giving, uh, all of your records. Um, you say, well, how do I get that? I don't have that. On the way out, there's kind of a uh, teal-colored card uh, in the brochure holder on the way out, grab one of those. It'll show you how to do it, okay? All right.
Very good. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for being here, even on this holiday. I know it's not a, technically a holiday weekend, but whenever you have uh, July 4th in the middle of the week, you have both weekends or holidays uh, surrounding that. So, But I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, don't miss next Sunday. And uh, we're going uh, to talk about uh, really how does Jesus look at the world? How does Jesus handle uh, getting the good news to everyone? What are we supposed to do with that? And then, of course, on the 21st, I'll be uh, talking to you about uh, what's going on in South Africa. Okay? Let's everyone stand. And I want you to know that I love you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. Let's pray, Lord. I pray that you give us a great day. Thank you for allowing us to live another day. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.